think it's time to start with the next talk, which is uh, me talking about Debicam. So the most important announcement is we finally have a logo. I uh, plucked this together last year, I think, or two years ago. Um, so Debicam is uh, something I started about 12 years ago now. Um, I got into Debian because I studied chemistry. And um, there were basically no chemistry packages in Debian around the turn of the century. Um, I was back then a student, and there was one program called ChemTool, which you can use to um, draw chemical 2D structures, which you need for, for your studies. And I was doing a bit of upstream work on it, and I thought, OK, I'll uh, package that for Debian. I'm, I'm using Debian for five or six years. Why not get into it? And then just when I got about it, uh, some guy called Dr. Günther Bechle or something um, ITP'd it and uploaded it to Debian. I was like, ah, damn, that was my one chance to become a Debian developer. And it's gone. It's the only chemistry package I know which is open source. And then a couple of months later, he actually resigned from Debian for personal reasons. So I decided to take it over. And um, at that time, um, there was almost no um, free software in, in about chemistry. So as a, as a 100 foot overview, Debicam is a Debian pure plant, blend. Um, it's officially started 2006, but I mean the, the, the thing itself has been going on since I started packaging chemistry packages around 2000. So right now we have 30 persons with commit access, but it's mostly a couple of people actually doing a lot of work, and um, we have now 100 source packages. Um, I'm mostly, I've since been focusing on computational chemistry, so that's the packages I mostly maintain, but I've also not been actually employed as a chemist for the last nine years. So this is only a volunteer thing for me, um, and I guess for most other people, except for Graham Inks, who works at University of South Africa, who was at last year's StepConf. So he's actually main, um, a deep, an administrator at the chemistry department there, or chemical engineering, I guess. And he, he gets to work quite a bit on Ubuntu and Debian packages for, for that field. So. Just takes a while. So that's one of the graphs that uh, Andreas, I don't know, did you show? No. Well, this is the uploaded statistics for, for Debicam, but Andreas is doing those statistics. So you can see I'm the orange person. So at, for the first couple of years, I did it all by myself. Um, and around 2006, we started the, the um, subversion um, repository because other people wanted to participate. And that was mostly Daniel Leidert, who did a lot of work from 2008 to 2013, roughly. But then in the last couple of years, he kind of disappeared. So he, he showed up again a bit uh, two years ago, and we actually, he met, well, he came to Heidelberg. But I actually haven't heard from him for a while. So he has, he has unfortunately kind of disappeared. And then Filippo Rosconi, he's doing um, mass spectrometry packages, so, but he's mostly working on his own, on the chem so he has one or two people, but they're doing their stuff, and I'm doing the computation chemistry stuff, so we're a bit disjoint. But he's been doing a lot of work, and then um, Nicolas Breen, uh, is, he's packaging Gromax, which is a molecular dynamics uh, software, but he's, that's basically the only package he's maintaining, but he's doing it all the time. And uh, the next one is then Graham Inks, who has been working we started to do a lot of work uh, this year, last year, so he's, he's very, quite active. And then it's Andreas already. So as you can see, there were one or two people, and it's mostly me there, and it's mostly uh, Daniel. For some reason, last year, I did apparently a lot of uploads. Um, or maybe that was Sebastian. No, that's not possible, 12. So I, yeah, I did a lot of uploads last year. I don't remember that, actually, because I thought I didn't have a lot of time. But maybe it's because of the source-only uploads now that I tend to do more uploads these days. So as I said, the original mission statement for um, Debicam was package all chemistry-related free and open source software. There's not so few of them. Actually, there was only 
like four or five in 2001. Chemtool I already mentioned, MPQC, which is the massively parallel quantum chemistry. That means that meant like 16 cores in parallel or something in 2000. And a few other um, viewers, garlic and chemical. Garlic uh, chemical was a GTK or is a GTK 2 based um, visual 3D viewer. So that, that was it. There was these five things, and we, we packaged it, and there was not a lot. There was a bit more coming on after a couple of years in 2006. Uh, we had 20 packages, uh, I checked that, and now it's 100, so it slowly got more and more, and uh, nowadays actually the mission statement I would say is package the most useful versatile projects in each field, because uh, it turned out that there's five or six packages to, to write um, chemical structures, and there's like 10 or 20 different ones to three-dimensionally visualize molecules, and it doesn't make sense to actually package them all. Um, because they're a huge overlap, but on the other hand, it's also quite difficult to figure out which ones are the ones which are useful. Um, and also, actually, I found out that even more so in computation chemistry, there's a huge difference in performance. So we had one project called the QM speed test by Nola Boyle, um, who was just running optimizations of, of a molecule, I think it was aspirin or something, on different codes, and, and actually there's a factor of 50 or something in the runtime, it's huge. Like one, some packages are done in two minutes and another one took three hours for the same stuff. So there's a huge difference between code bases, which are Fortran, which have been optimized since the 70s, versus some guys doing a C++ project over the summer. Um, it's the same algorithms, but the implementation is, is very different. So right now, we try to do that. For example, just last week, there was another article um, in the Journal of Computation Chemistry about another thing, PyRadius, a well-done medium-sized Python library for rare events. So that's another open source thing. So every, there's a new one coming up every week, uh, I have the feeling. And uh, actually, I have another 100 packages on a list of prospective packages, um, which are all free software. Um, there's a few really big ones. Siesta, for example, is a very well-known code in, in the periodic um, or crystal community, um, which got open source a while ago. We should package it. Big DFT is pretty pretty well known, and um, PySCF. A um, couple of those are, are really should be packaged, but we don't get around to it uh, that much. But th there's 100 at least that we know of, so at least twice the size that we already have. So we should really make a point in only packaging the more important ones. So what I want to do next is give a few examples of really innovative things, because at the beginning, there was open source in the, in the let's say, nodes, um, trying to catch up, like give a, the same functionality as proprietary software. But nowadays, actually, there is uh, open source codes, especially in computation and chemistry, which are w even are more advanced than the, the best proprietary software codes, or at least they caught up to it very much so. So one of them is uh, Bagel, which is uh, done by Toro Shiozaki in Northwestern, and he, he basically wrote it over the last couple of three years with a couple of grad students himself, but they're doing pretty awesome stuff, for example, on the fly, CASP2 surface hopping dynamics, and nobody did that actually, not even a, um, so this is a paper from, from a month ago or something. Um, I don't think there's even a proprietary part package that does that. Or um, just two weeks ago, um, they published a new part of NWCAM, which is a huge code base uh, from the Northwestern Laboratory in, in the US. Um, pushing configuration interaction to the limit. It's, as you can maybe not read, um, they have uh, one trillion orbitals or whatever um, going on in their, in their calculations. So it's massive on huge clusters, and then this is really co competitive code. Or another one from Zurich, uh, they, they're doing CP2K, which is a Debicam package for, for a long time. And they are actually simulating, they have simulations of millions of atoms in, in one simulation. And each atom is actually, uh, actually modeled on the quantum scale. It's not just the sphere or something, as you have in molecular dynamics. Those are really quantum uh, molecular dynamics with real quantum chemistry behind it. But on the other hand, these 
advances in, in open source got people quite a bit unhappy, all these proprietary people. And so, for example, a while ago, there was this letter or this viewpoint, they say, in the Journal of Chemistry, uh, Physical Chemistry letter saying, what is the price of open source software? And it was from, a lot, uh, there was like 10 or 20 authors, and they're all the main authors of the proprietary software packages in the field of computation chemistry. And they say, yeah, you know, everybody says you should open source everything, but really, um, we have such a complicated code base. Um, so, for example, QCAM has 300 papers, and we have like 5 million or 2.5 million lines of code, and we have so many developers, and um, it's really, really hard work to do. So um, we cannot just open source it, and uh, people should continue funding our proprietary model of uh, innovation. And actually what I've saw in the last couple of years is that there is a very big change in the sense that funding agencies, like the, in that case the German funding agency, DFG, are not funding, well what they're doing is they're funding research for new um, algorithms and stuff, but they won't fund proprietary software just for the maintenance of it. So for example, there's this code from Stuttgart called IMD, and what they write is like, IMD has now been placed under the GNU GPL as a consequence of moving the repository to GitHub, which that's a bit stupid because that's not a requirement, but okay, and the requirements of the funding agency DFG. So the DFG told them, okay, if you want money from us, you should make it open source, and they did. So that's quite a huge impact, I guess, that open source has there. And I also heard from, privately, from a colleague of mine, there is a huge code uh, in the Fritz Haber Institute in Berlin, and they also have a lot of trouble because it's proprietary to get grants these days. And um, what they're doing now is they're open sourcing their underlying linear algebra um, libraries and, and trying to make new projects out of them. So in order to get some funding at least, yeah, because they, they cannot get funding for their proprietary parts. So, and there has been a couple of previous open sourcing, and WCAM I already mentioned. It used to be proprietary, but they open sourced it about 10 years ago or something. Sci3, Sci4, these are um, standard packages for students to simulate molecules, and uh, they're rewrites. So Sci1, 2 used to be proprietary, those are now GPL. And uh, CS I just mentioned, and there's NECI, which just got um, open sourced a couple of months ago. So in, in a sense, it was on GitHub, and then suddenly somebody put the GPL on it. Well, one of the authors, so it's legit, but now it's, now it's really open source. So that's as, a, as an introduction. I want to just mention what, what DebbieCam does these days. These are the tasks. Uh, Andreas talked about it earlier. So we split it up a bit more fine-grained in these days. I actually did some work on that. I, um, I think it didn't land in Jesse back then, but now it's in stretch at least. So we have mm, 12 tasks, I would say. We have uh, crystallography and um, analytical biochemistry. This is what Ros Rosconi is mostly doing, and I'm mostly working on molecular ab initio, molecular dynamics, molecular modeling, and periodic ab initio stuff. And then they have lots of packages which produce or in uh, input, uh, output stuff. Um, there are some major packages which I don't want to get into because I don't have a lot of time. I uh, just want to mention that yeah, there's also okay. Yeah, for visualization, for example, we have Pymol, we, we, which got uh, mentioned earlier. Very grateful that it got picked up because I didn't have the time. And Jmol got also picked up by uh, Infinity Zero, I guess. Um, so this was finally upgraded, so there's some, some cooperation happening there. So those are all the packages, but there's also a lot of interdependencies on the packages. Um, so I decided to make a graph of all the build dependencies, at least for the computational chemistry packages, so that's probably a bit, bit difficult to read. But those are the libraries, and there are lots of interdependencies, for example, MPQC3. Um, has a lot of libraries, and libxedef is used in a lot of packages. Um, same as, as libint. These are just the chemistry packages. A lot of them, of course, use the linear, linear algebra packages like BLAS, LAPAC, or the MPI packages um, like OpenMPI. And this one is how the input-output things work. So we have a couple of packages like OpenBubble, Python ASE, Avogadro, and um, 
Travis and Cecilip, that parse the output of packages to either compute properties or just display properties of them, or to transform those outputs into other um, file formats. And what they also can do is produce inputs, because most of these packages, actually, they, they still rely on text input and output. So it's a, you have an input file, you run the input file on some executable, and then you get an output file. But this is getting going even further. For example, there was a recent paper for the Sci4 from the Sci4 developers, and they, this is a, actually a graph from their paper, uh, which is in the Journal of Chemical Theory and Computation. And they uh, have all these uh, external projects which they integrate, and they're all open source except for MRCC, I think. Um, and we haven't, well, we have packaged lib int, but all, and chem MPS2. Yeah? Those two are packaged, but all the other ones are still not packaged. So we have quite some work to do here. Um, but they can also be used by, by Sci4 uh, in, in order to, to um, make their uh, work better. A um, couple of packages that are new in, in Stretch, I don't want to get into too much detail here, but as I said, JML got updated, that's, that's great. Sci4 is finally at 1.0. This is a very standard package for people to work on. Um, CP2K got updated, and um, Graham Inks br brought ASE, the atomic system simulation environment, into Debian. Um, finally, I want to talk a bit about outreach that I tried to do at least. So in 2015, I gave a talk about CP2K and Debicam in Zurich at the CP2K developer meeting, which was uh, quite nice. There was also a guy from Fedora there, so they invited us, uh, giving a talk about how we package stuff. And I also presented two posters in the summer of 2015 at the 10th European Conference on Computation Chemistry in Fulda, and a few weeks later in the Symposium for Theoretical Chemistry in Potsdam. So I made this uh, Debicam poster, which was also actually in, in, I actually also presented it in, in or it got printed for South uh, Africa last year and hang up at the open day. But I made this poster uh, of Debicam, um, all the uh, capabilities of the computation and chemistry packages, and uh, got into some, quite some interesting talks. So a lot of those people knew Debian, but um, not really Debicam. It's always the same problem with the pure plants thing. Um, but that gave some, some outreach, I guess. So finally, I want to give let's talk a little bit about what's, what's left to do. So one thing I sh think we should really do, and I'm a bit not happy that it's not happening upstream, is that there should be more input-output parsers for, for the Debian packages. So we have uh, Avogadro, which is a um, graphical KDE application or Qt application which can read um, and, and generate input, but it's not doing it for all the, the packages we have. And OpenBubble is, uh, is also in CCLib. These are packages which we could extend. Um, for example, CCLib is just Python, so it's rather easy. So a couple of packages like CP2K, Bagel, and Aces are not really represented there. So maybe there is a GSOC program, uh, Google Summer of Code project looking there. Um, we should switch finally from subversion to Git. Um, Daniel Leider liked subversion very much, so uh, we didn't force it, but he's not really active then more, and then if new people want to work on something, they can just um, uh, convert stuff to Git, as happened with PyMole, I think, for example, and some others. There's just a question of whether we just use the Debian directory or the full project. It's easier, I guess, if you do the switch to just use the Debian um, directory, but we'll see that. I would like to get more serious on backports. Um, I have been backporting one or two packages, but not as well as the NeuroDebian team does. They are unfortunately not here, but they are really doing great work on that. And, uh, and then there's the other things, um, like what to do about the MPI implementation. There was quite a few problems with MP open MPI in the stretch release cycle, and I heard from some upstreams that now, uh, open MPI is not working with us. It's not, it's not good if you actually have both multiple threads and multiple processes, which nowadays is the case. So you would have a cluster where you run the program on several nodes, several computers on the cluster, but each cluster would have 16 cores. So you don't want to run one thread on each node. You want to run 16 threads and then 16 cores. And for that kind of thing, apparently, open MPI had a lot of problems, but they are supposedly fixed, so we'll see. But I think one thing that it's going forward is we saw on the Debian science list, I think that 
at least some packages like ScalarPack will be compiled for both MPI-CH and OpenMPI, so you can choose your, your um, stack. So for example, for Bagel, I used MPI-CH because it was more stable. Um, the other thing is the DH Fortran, Fortran 90 module pr thing that's looming over us all the time. Um, it's again stuck. Every DevConf is going a bit forward, but it's again stuck, I guess. So maybe we sh I or somebody should start working on that. I would also have things about more, um, a bit, a bit about optimizing packages for uh, production use. So right now we have to go with the lowest common denominator, which means MTU native or such is not possible. So it would be good if we could integrate it that you can just recompile your package and it's, it's running at, at machine speed, if that's actually useful. We should also benchmark it. It's a bit difficult to, to say anything about it without running proper benchmarks. And then we should remove the packages which are outdated. So there's a quite a few ones which are 90s technology and there's been better ones in the since, and we should look at them and actually remove them. Or maybe if they're just too slow, if they're doing computational stuff and then other packages are way faster, just remove them. But we haven't really started doing that yet. So that's it, basically, for me. That's uh, some context. We have a Debbie Chemdeval mailing list. There's an IC channel, but it's not used really. And the subversion and Git repo. And if you're interested in chemistry packaging, always happy to collaborate or to help or to just give you access. Yeah. So thanks, and is there any questions? And we anyway overrun anyway, so I guess it's fine if there's no questions. And we'll be continuing with the science both in about nine minutes at half past three. Okay, thanks. <laughs>